Hello and welcome to the Fighting Spur Podcast. As always, I'm Jason and I'm here to bring you the fight picks for Tyron Woodley versus Gilbert Burns taking place in Las Vegas, Nevada on May 30th. We have a new fight, a new card in Vegas. Things are hopefully returning to normal slowly but surely. Let's get into those picks. Here's the show. Alright, so before we get into the picks, I want to address the question that was left on our Facebook page. So if you want to get in touch with the Fighting Spirit Podcast, please reach out to me at fightingspiritpodcast at gmail.com or go ahead and like the Facebook page, leave a comment anywhere you can find the show. And of course, there's the Patreon as well, where you will find some fight picks or betting tips that I'll put there shortly after you listen to this. So let's go address our question though, because it does pertain to our main event. Brett writes to us, Woodley is blessed to be ranked number one after his lackluster performance and inactivity. Do you agree? Yes, absolutely. Tyron Woodley, despite you know his longevity and his performance as a champion, has certainly stumbled ever since he has lost the belt. He's been very inactive, and I do not think he should be your number one contender or ranked number one at welterweight. For sure. I think there's much better uh, competition out there, but I think this is still a good fight for Burns because he's able to make his name off of a former champion. Tyron Woodley's name still carries a lot of weight with it, but with other fighters out there, like I'm looking at the ESPN rankings and these seem a little bit off. Yeah. Oh no. Okay. Hold on. This is from the wrong year. Let's go ahead and pull up the right year. All right. I found something from 2015, but this is the official UFC website, ufc.com slash rankings. This is current. And Tyron Woodley is your number one, as Bert had mentioned earlier, but guys like Covington, Masvidal Edwards, I can see them being more deserving of being at the number one slot. But at the same time too, I can see how Burns can make a name for himself. And so that's why I think this fight is taking place. But to go to your second point, and it kind of gets us into my discussion here, does Tyra Woodley ever win a fight again in the UFC? And you do not believe he does. I believe that he's certainly capable of winning a fight in the UFC. I just think it's going to come down to will he fight somebody he can beat? And spoiler alert, I do not believe he can beat Gilbert Burns. I am picking Gilbert Burns in this contest. Let's go ahead and talk about why. Actually, before we do that, um, I think the deal with Woodley will be that he will not fight guys that are you know up-and-comers for the most part, so his competition will always be tough if he continues to fight. So I think you very well could be right, but there's certainly fighters he could take on if he was willing to go a little more gatekeeper status. Uh, that I think he could beat. I just don't think that'll ever take place. I don't see Woodley fighting, you know, just to be on the card, just to collect some cash. I, I don't think he's the kind of guy that operates like that. He would, would rather do other stuff with his time than prepare for fights and collect small paydays. But anyways, let's talk about Burns here versus Woodley. And I think here what we're going to see is Tyron Woodley run into a problem named Gilbert Burns. Gilbert Burns is highly active. Five fights in a row that he has won. He hasn't lost since 2018 with Dan Hooker, but we've seen his striking improve. We've seen his grappling solid as ever. And the only thing he has to really deal with, in my personal opinion, is the explosiveness of Woodley. However, will that explosiveness be there? We didn't see it in the Usman fight, and we didn't even really see it in a lot of his title defenses. We saw it until, but we didn't see it with Damian Maya, and then with Steven Thompson, he was trying to counter-strike him and didn't really move. But the last time we really saw an effective Tyron Woodley was in the Darren Till fight. And Darren Till was green, I think, by comparison to Gilbert Burns, a guy who is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Championships, who has been fighting now in the UFC for quite a while, is 18-3 and three in his MMA career overall. I think he's a guy that's going to be able to perform under the lights, and he's not going to hesitate to pull the trigger, I think, like what we saw with Darren Till when he took on Woodley. I think that Gilbert Burns is going to be able to, honestly, if not get this to the ground, work off of his back in an effective way, or we'll see that Woodley is too hesitant to pull the trigger and work that wrestling game. In which case, without the explosiveness being there, I think Gilbert Burns is able to hang with him 
on the feet and he's able to strike with him. You know, we know that Woodley throws great flurries of strikes. He'll throw three, four, five shots in a row very quick, but I don't know if he's going to be able to land those shots because I don't know if his speed advantage is still there. And Burns is going to be able to take advantage of that. He also has no ring rust. He's been very active, as I said earlier. And I think that's going to play a huge factor here because he just has the better, you know, experience over this last couple of years. He really, you know, Woodley hasn't really fought um, during the time that, that Burns has been on this great streak. He last fought March 2nd, 2019, lost to Usman. And we see that Burns has had several fights since then. From a pure statistic standpoint, we also got to look at the fact that while, you know, Woodley is a great wrestler and his takedown defense is phenomenal, Burns still has a pretty high takedown rate. And while his accuracy isn't great, he certainly could work those clinch those clinch games to get inside and to take him down where I think he could have his, his way with him. The other thing, too, is that Burns actually is a higher output striker, and I believe that if it does stay standing, he should be able to bare minimum point his way to victory and stay away from those fast, heavy hands of Woodley if they're even as fast as they used to be. So in this main event, we are picking Gilbert Burns to, I think, put his name at the top of the welterweight division. All right, in our co-main event, we have one maybe I wouldn't pick as the co-main, but we got two heavyweights, Legoy Ivanov taking on Augusto Sakai. So I'm not really high on either one of these guys. Uh, Augusto Sakai has obviously shown himself to be a very effective heavyweight fighter. He's 14-1. and one. Uh, He's coming off of a knockout against Marcin Tybura. And Legoy Ivanov came off a very competitive fight with Derek Lewis, which you could argue he could have won. It was a split decision loss, but he's also a very, very good fighter. Uh, and this one, though, you know, it's honestly kind of tough to, to say. I know Ivanov is tough, but Sakai seems to have the power. 11 KOs uh, versus the Blagoy Ivanov, 6 KOs and 6 submissions. I think as long as this thing stays standing, because we know that Sakai doesn't really have any kind of, you know, grappling or submission game. I think as long as it stays standing, I like Sakai's chances here. I know that Ivanov is very durable. You can certainly hit him with big shots, and he doesn't necessarily go down like Sakai has experienced in the past by putting people away. Um, But I I still like him here. I think he's going to edge out Ivanov. The only real question, you know, if he can't put him away, though, is I believe Ivanov is going to have the better better endurance in this matchup, and I think that he could potentially, you know— have his gas tank called into question, especially being as big a man as he is. He is a little bit bigger than Ivanov. Ivanov is really, uh, you know, kind of a small guy for heavyweight coming in at only 5'11", and he's built like a little tank or, you know, little for the division. And that could be a problem as we go into deeper rounds, assuming Sakai cannot shut him down early. We'll see how it plays out, though. Maybe Ivanov will try to exploit uh, what could be you know, a lack of grappling game, it seems, out of Sakai. Uh, but if he does stand with him, I think Sakai does take it away. I think he could shut his lights out. He certainly has done it most of the time, 79% of the time in the past. So I am picking Gusto Sakai to pick up a win in this heavyweight matchup. Okay, this next one here is I was about to start recording it. I just found out that there is not going to be an opponent for Daniel Rodriguez and Kevin Holland is injured. He is out of that bout. I was about to make a call on that one, but uh, I will hold off on it. Right now, it's his unknown fighter. It will either be canceled or they will get a late replacement for Daniel Rodriguez. Uh, I may make a Twitter or Facebook post about it, or it'll just end up maybe being on the MMA uh, tips if something does come through. But uh, that fight has just been canceled as of about a um, few hours ago from this recording. So just keep that in mind. All right, let's move on to the next one, though, that is taking place. All right, in the next one here, I am counting this as a debut fight. I am not counting this as one that uh, has experienced fighters in it. So that changes kind of the information that I gather for it. Uh, Just keep that in mind. And the reason I'm doing that is because Roosevelt Roberts, he's a a vet in the UFC. He's had several good fights so far. He's been fighting in the UFC since 2018. But Brock Weaver has only had the one fight, and he was not winning that fight. He caught an illegal knee in a fight that he was getting badly beaten in by Rodrigo Vargas. And he should not have won. He said he couldn't continue. They gave him the disqualification, and hey, that's how she, that's all she wrote. But I, I could not use the information available in that first fight, I think, to make a competent pick. So we're saying it's a debut fight for Weaver. He's having his second debut. Uh, but I honestly don't think this debut is going to go well for him. We did not see much of, out of him in the 
uh, debut where he took on Vargas. Vargas, I think, really, really knocked that guy around. And Roosevelt Roberts, an experienced fighter, 9-1, uh, with you know very effective hands and submissions, I think is going to be too much for Weaver to handle. Uh, I think Weaver is going to basically get picked apart, either technically on the feet or find himself on his back, you know, gasping it, gasping for air and not able to, you know, put on any kind of work uh, for Roberts. And we have not seen Weaver score any takedowns in the UFC. His submission game, uh, while okay at three submissions over 15 wins, I don't think is all that effective. And I do not see him picking up a W here. We are going in heavy for Roosevelt Roberts to pick up a win in this lightweight matchup. All right, in our next matchup, we're going to have Dime Piece of the Night, where Hannah's Shockwave Seifer is going to be taking on Mackenzie Dime Dern in what should be an interesting ladies matchup. So we have Mackenzie Dern coming off a loss. She's going back to strawweight, though, so she'll be fighting at the 115-pound weight class. Does she make weight? That's the first question we have to ask ourselves. I'm not sure. We'll see how that one goes. She's had trouble making it in the past, but let's assume she makes weight and all goes right for it. I honestly still think, despite her coming off a loss where she wasn't that effective against Amanda Rebus, we'll be able to pick up a win over Hannah Seifers. Hannah Seifers has struggled in some of her last outings. I don't think they were dominant, even when she did win. The split decision win over Pollyanna Viana. She did get a okay win against Jody Escobel, and then obviously a stoppage loss to Andrea Hill, and then a loss before that to Macy Barber. So I don't think Seifers is the one to really do it. I think that her striking Seifers is not honestly the best. Granted, she does have the five KOs over 10 wins, but I think the problem is, is you know, against certain competition, sure, his, her striking is good. She last had a knockout uh, back in 2018, but that was before she got into the UFC. She's only been able to knock out talent that was not at UFC levels, and she's never been able to score a submission against anyone at any of those points in time. And she actually has one submission loss. And what does Dern do very well? She is a submission specialist. Her pathway to victory is submission. She has four over her seven wins. And I believe that she will be able to do that to Seifers. Assuming that she, you know, can put up a good enough striking affair to get it to the cage, to grind it out, get her to the ground. And that's how I see this playing out. I think McGinsey Dern honestly has her way with her once it's off the feet. And even if it's on the feet, I don't think Seifers possesses the striking talent to honestly put Dern away. So we'll see how it plays out. This is also taking consideration. We don't know if Dern is going to make weight. 115 pounds is tough for her uh, to make, but assuming she does it, I see her walking away with a W here in Las Vegas. All right, very interesting fight in this one. We have Kaylin Shikagan coming off of a loss to... Uh, Valentina Shevchenko now fighting the lesser Shevchenko. Uh, no, no knock on Antonia, but she's not Valentina. We know that for sure. Uh, she's going to be fighting the other Shevchenko, which is an interesting booking. And uh, certainly will be weird and shitty for her if she loses to both, for sure. And that's how I see it playing out. I think that Shikagian is going to be defeated by Shevchenko again. Another Shevchenko. Uh, I, I think, you know, obviously... She worked very closely with her sister, Antonia does. I think that the knowledge set will be there. I think the skill set will be there. Valentina obviously knows how to beat her. The Tiger Muay Thai camp knows how to beat her. And I think that that's going to be the problem for Shikagian. Shikagian is trained well. She is a competent fighter, but she's also a bit of a decision artist. And I think it's going to be difficult for her to get a decision win over Shevchenko. Granted, Shevchenko does win a lot of decisions herself, but I think she has a little bit more shut-the-door power uh, to, to pick up a win here, and I think she could put a hurting on Shikagian. Also, Shikagian's not going to have a real big, I think, you know, like reach or size advantage uh, because Antonia is also pretty large herself, and so I don't think she's going to be able to take as much advantage of that linky frame that she tends to put over on most other women. She only has a one-inch height advantage and a one-inch reach advantage in this 125-pound division. Also, Antonia is a southpaw fighter, and I think that could potentially you know, create issues for Caitlin Chikagian, uh, just dealing with that, you know, less orthodox style. And I'm sure the switch stance is going to be there if Shevchenko needs to take advantage. I am picking Antonia Pantera Shevchenko to pick up a win over Caitlin Chikagian. All right, this next one here, I don't have too much to say. Both these guys are going to be having their second ever UFC fight. 
uh, in Spike Carlisle, the Alpha Ginger take on Billy Quarantilo. In this one, I am picking up the Alpha Ginger as I think our projected winner here. But honestly, the information of both these guys is a little bit short. Both of them have five knockouts over their wins. We have nine for Carlisle, 13 for Quarantilo. Uh, Carlisle has the one loss via decision, and Quartanilo has one loss via KO and decision. They're both very close. They both have submissions in their game, uh, representing about the same percentage, 33 percentage of his wins for Carlisle and 38% submission victories for Quartanilo. So honestly, very similar fighters very early in their careers, although Quartanilo is 31 years old, whereas Carlisle is a little more in his prime at 27. And because we really only have that one fight to go off of, it's a little bit tough. It's also going to be a catchweight fight. I'm not exactly sure uh, what the catchweight is going to be at this point in time. In fact, let's look that up real quick and I'll get back to you. All right, so that's looking like a 150-pound fight uh, at catchweight. So these guys are typically featherweights. We're coming in at 150 for the catchweight fight. So uh, we'll, we'll see how things play out here. You know, like, like I said, there's not a lot of information to go off of. They both had great wins in their first outing, super high output, um, great submission game from Billy, what we saw in his first outing. So honestly, it's going to be a tough call. Obviously, Spike hat does close the door earlier based on that one fight he had at only a minute, 25 seconds. Uh, but we'll see how things go. Uh, I, I like Carlisle on this one, like I said, based off of what I see, based off the numbers available. The Alpha Ginger is the pick in Vegas. All right, another solid fight here. We have Clidson Abreu taking on Jamal Sweet Dreams Hill. And in this one, it's going to be, I think, another interesting fight, a little like we saw with Carlisle. We have fighters with, you know, not necessarily the most experience between the two of them. Obviously, Kilson Abreu has been here a little bit longer, but he has not looked very good while he's been here. Two losses out of his three fights in the UFC. Losses to Makomed Engelev and Shamil Gastamov. He does have a win over Sam Alvey, and Jamal Hill has a win over Darko Stoisik. And I think Jamal Hill, 7-0, looking like a hot talent coming in. I think he's going to be able to impose his will on Clidson Abreu and pick up a win here. Um, even though we haven't seen much out of him, Darko Stoisik is a great talent, and he put him away uh, with via unanimous decision. I think he's going to be able to do the same to Abreu. I think he's going to be able to either A, shut the door via decision, or potentially put his lights out, because Hill does seem to have have a good bit of power with three wins over seven, uh, seven sorry three KOs over seven wins ending via knockout now it's not taking anything away from Abreu he does have some knockouts himself but he's mostly a submission artist with 10 submissions over his 15 wins let's assume Hill keeps it standing which he's going to need to in order to win I think that he is able to put it on Abreu at that point as long as he can keep it a keep it as a stand-up affair so we'll see how things play out on Saturday, but I am picking up Sweet Dream Hill as the pick. Kind of feel like this is, uh, you know, how the mighty have fallen sort of moment. Uh, we have Tim Elliott taking on Brandon Royval. So Royval has uh, no fights in the UFC. He's coming out of the LFA promotion. He's he's coming off of two first round armbar wins. So he's, he's looking like a hot product coming in. And he's taking on Tim Elliott, a guy that did win the Ultimate Fighter, was able to fight Demetrius Johnson. I think he actually won a round against him. And then it was just kind of off and on. He comes back, beats Smolka. You think, hey, okay, maybe this guy's coming back. Loses to Ben Nguyen. Okay, not doing so great. Then he goes and he gets a submission win over Mark De La Rosa. Then back-to-back decision losses against Devinson Figueredo and Askar Askarov. So it's been hit and miss, honestly, for Tim Elliott. He's been a guy that catches lightning in a bottle, it seems, at times. And I think, honestly, he's on the verge of getting bounced out of the UFC for Roy Val here. I think Roy Val is going to make a statement in this 125-pound weight class. And I honestly think that he's going to get a win here. We don't have a whole lot to go off of. He he did lose to Casey Kenny in a five-round war. Uh, Roy Val did. But I think that he's honestly going to be able to come out of here and put away a guy that doesn't always perform very well. Also, speaking of Casey Kenny, he's going to be in the next matchup we'll be talking about in a second. But I think that Brandon Roy Val is going to pick up a UFC debut win in this matchup against Tim Elliott. As I said earlier, speaking of Casey Kenny, he is also going to have a fight. He's going to be taking on Luis Smolka, the guy we just mentioned. In this one, I like Kenny a lot. I think that he's going to be able to pick up a win despite coming off a loss to Mirab Devalivishvili. 
And I think he's going to be able to defeat Smolka here. Smolka, you know, solid fighter coming off a win in his last outing. Uh, but I think he's going to run into an issue with the aggressive Kenny. Kenny does hit hard for this division. He also has very good submission ability. And I think he's just a little bit better uh, than Smolka everywhere he needs to be. So he is going to be the pick in this contest. I am picking Casey Kenny to win this bantamweight contest. And then in the last one here, we're going to have a featherweight fight with Chris Gutierrez versus Vince Morales. So in this one, I do actually like Morales. Um, I, I honestly, my gut pick is to go with Gutierrez, but I like Morales here. Despite the fact he's coming off a loss, uh, and we know Gutierrez is coming off of two wins in a row, but they weren't the most solid wins, you know, one via unanimous decision and one via split decision. Uh, so we'll see how things play out. I know Gutierrez does bring the heat. He does have heart and hitting hands, uh, but I think Morales actually has the harder hitting hands, uh, and he does throw down, which could make for a very exciting fight the way these guys operate. Uh, in the end, though, I am picking Vendetta Morales to defeat Chris El Guapo Gutierrez in this flyweight, sorry, featherweight contest. All right, so let's go over them one more time. We have Burns, Sakai, Roberts, Dern, Shevchenko, Carlisle, Hill, Royval, Kenny, and Morales to round things out. Also, that uh, Kevin Holland fight was canceled, so just keep that in mind that uh, there has to be a replacement now for uh, for Daniel Rodriguez, or, or for somebody to step in to take on Daniel Rodriguez. We'll see how that uh, plays out, though. Uh, yeah, so... Like I said, we'll have a card coming out on the 30th. I don't know where that puts us, though, for future events. Right now, let's look at the upcoming ones. So it says June 6th, so it should be the week after. We'll have UFC 250. Uh, that one is still, I think, coming. Uh, yeah, it's still coming together. It's still looking like just the five fights, including Amanda Nunes and Felicia Spencer for the Women's Featherweight Championship. So hopefully that card will round itself out and become a little bit more competitive to keep us all engaged. And then realistically, you know, the next one we're going to have to look forward to is going to be around July 4th. Uh, that is the next pay-per-view. So the biggest one of the year should be on its way. July 4th is on a Saturday. So that adds to the excitement for sure. It's certainly going to be fireworks if I know how Dana White operates. There's obviously a lot going on through the rumor mill right now for that. Uh, everything from, well, Connor Diaz three at this point Masvidal Diaz two for the BMF uh we have Connor potentially fighting for the welterweight championship that's been talked about with Usman we potentially could have Usman versus uh Masvidal for the welterweight championship it would make more sense uh I've heard also you know potentially having Connor fight Gaethje because of the situation that Khabib is in with his father and if he'll be able to return there's so many rumors going through the mill right now. I'm not sure what to predict will take place in July. It's just way too hard to say. If I had to put my money on it, though, honestly, I, I think I think Connor versus Masvidal is, is really the best fight to make, in my personal opinion. I, I think that one is fun. Uh, and then, really, anything else with Connor? I mean, hell, there's always the DS3 fight. I'm sure that can come, you know, come together anytime. Usman versus Masvidal too. I'd love to see that one. That one would be a good one. But we'll see how things play out. I, 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 you know, we'll see what the MMA gods have in store for us. And I'm sure it'll be exciting no matter what we get. Uh, so like I said, we'll be back with, well, we're actually, we'll do our fight pick and retrospective show for UFC 250. That'll be coming out next Tuesday. So until I speak with you again, happy fight picking.